Our cameras have been at the Clinton County Historical Museum on Court Street in Plattsburgh many times, uh, but just about a year ago, we came here to do a very special program right after 9-11 with our friend Ed Scullin. How are you, Ed? I'm great, thanks. That, uh, that was, we had some pressure, some things on our minds when we were here last time about 9-11, and we talked about that briefly when we began our program here, but it turned out to be a good television show for so many so many ways. I've had many comments about that. I'm glad to hear it. It was a pleasure to do. Well, this Valcor project, historical project, uh, doing underwater archaeology to discover what we can about the remnants from the Battle of Valcor has been so exciting for me just to watch. I know it's been unbelievable for you. Yeah, we've, we've learned a lot. Even since the uh, last time we've talked, there's been much more that uh, we've learned. The exhibits come together really well. The Maritime Museum has uh, put together a draft report for uh, uh, the Navy and for uh, the New York State Museum. We're very proud of, and uh, we've got a lot of work to do yet. And uh, Things are coming together really well. That's great. And many of the artifacts that we talked about and saw slides of the last time are on display here, and we're going to really enjoy seeing those. Calvin and I thought it might be a good idea just to start here in the hallway to look at this map, which was on the former air base, I think, wasn't it, at one point in time, and ended up here at the Clinton County Historical Museum, Battle of Valcor Sound. Uh, many of us remember September 11th, 1814, but if you have your way, lots more people will know October 11th, 1776. Right, very important event. It was actually America's first Navy, um, duking it out with the British and trying to protect Fort Ticonderoga, uh, keeping, uh, basically it was an, an action by Arnold to delay the British forces from getting to Ticonderoga before they were ready to deal with them. Now, I, just before we begin, and you're going to show me a great deal of material, including all the stuff you brought up from, the, from Lake Champlain, when did this project get started? Uh, this, project, project. this project got started in 1999. Um, like a lot of divers, um, basically the water's a time capsule. You get to go places that nobody's ever gone before. And uh, just wanted to make a connection with the past uh, and, and made a, a, a huge connection. One, beyond uh, my expectations at that time, and it's, it's still developing. It's just incredible how things keep going with this. Um, I contacted the Maritime Museum, and we started the Valcor Bay Research Project. It's fantastic. For those of you who are interested in history, and how can you not be when it's right in your backyard, there's a great deal on the Internet about this, thanks, thanks to our friend Jim Millard and others. Jim's been great. Uh, He's offered us a lot of space. Unfortunately, uh, I've been tied up with the project in my work, and we're a little behind, but I'm hoping to catch up. This, uh, <laughs> hoping to catch up over the winter. Um, but it's also led to some new developments with the project that we'll talk to you later about. We have so much ground to cover in the next hour and a half. I hope you stay with it, because our little corner loves to delve into the history of this area, support it, and uh, propagate the information so that everybody will know just what a rich history we have. This gives you a, a general idea. Uh, we'll give you a pretty more, uh, a guaranteed, we'll give you a more specific idea before we're f finished about the Battle of Valcor. Uh, but there are many ways to study it and look at it. And, you know, thanks to guys like Ed Scullin, who's been a trooper for how many years? Uh, 14 now. 14 years and been diving? Uh, I've been diving for over 20. Thanks to guys like Ed, um, they're bringing this history to actually to life. To be, I can picture a lot of school kids coming through here this fall and winter and enjoying this and going home and say, you know, we had a big battle out there at Valcor too, right. you know. Well, I hope they do, and it's a, it's a perfect opportunity. Actually, this uh, exhibit is slated to be here until uh, October of next year, and then it's actually going to go down to uh, the Naval Historical Center in Washington and be on display it, there. Right? And uh, yeah, and that's what we think it ought to do. We think it ought to travel around so people can see the role that the Champlain Valley played in the revolution and in our history. That's just absolutely fine. We're going to go in the, in the other room, take a look at some of these exhibits, and learn a lot more about this wonderful research project as our program continues. Just before Calvin pushed the on button, Ed Scullin said, we've just begun to touch the tip of the iceberg. And uh, this figurative iceberg is in Lake Champlain, and it's uh, 
called the Battle of Valcor. There are so many exciting things to study in this area in terms of American history. We had one of the oldest active military installations close a few years ago and we cried a lot. But look at the doors that have opened since that time. It's right. just fantastic. Before we begin, I want to give our viewers a little preview of the fact that we're going to be talking with other people besides Ed. We had Jerry Forkey over here who's responsible for taking so many photographs connected with the Battle of Valcor. We've got John Tompkins who opened the door for us this morning, right? All right, and he's actually, uh, he and the uh, Clinton County Historical Association have given us this, uh, this venue, the, the opportunity to show this to people in the North and Country. look at this fantastic presentation, which we're going to look at. we got Roger Harwood, whom we last saw on local television, traipsing through the woods out there on Crab Island. Right. Well, Roger's been at it for years. He's been a diver for years. And uh, he and another team of divers have actually teamed up with us. Uh, we've actually got three three teams of divers that are working in the Valcor area right now. We're working all together in concert with the Maritime Museum. And uh, it's going to grow by leaps and bounds, I'm sure. I, I just want to let our viewers know also that this, this isn't a pickup group of ruffians who decided to jump over the side of a boat and drag some things out of Lake Champlain. I mean, those are things we did 40 years ago in Lake Champlain. This is a well-organized project under the auspices of some pretty incredible organizations in Vermont and New York State. And the process that they go through to catalog these finds on the bottom of Lake Champlain is impressive and meticulous. And isn't it neat to be a part of such a deal? Yeah, and it really has to be, and that's the thing. And I, like I said before, you know, I just want to make a connection with the past, and I think that's all that any diver ever wanted to do. Um, and in, in a lot of circumstances, people would remove these things from the water and wanting to protect them. And unfortunately, without having the money to conserve them or protect them, they degrade. So they'd actually be doing the opposite. Where here, now we have an opportunity for local divers to, to make that connection, but do it under uh, a, a systematic method that um, the money's already obtained to conserve these things. Um, we've already gotten the permits and the processes from the, both the federal and the state authorities. Um, so we can do this, do it legally. Um, they can explore and make that connection and uh, have that connection even develop because uh, the Maritime Museum and the, the, all the people that we've developed, uh, the groups that we've developed since then, had uh, years and years and experience of going through records and now we're actually being able to put the records with the artifacts and uh, be able to find out so much more. So many things please me, and I, <clears throat> I want to go on with your information here, but I was reflecting on the show that we did the last time and the fact that you're able to make an actual connection between the past and the present. A gun blows up, you find a guy who was blown up when the gun blew up, you find his grave, contact descendants, I mean, this is fantastic. Right, and that was from the Maritime Museum and from a connection they had with a researcher. And he had, he had that information, and once he found out about us with the cannon, he was able to put it all in context for us. And uh, we've actually had more uh, developments on, on who that cannon uh, Have affected. Have you really? Yes, and I'll talk oh, to you about that. Goodness. All right, now what do we got here? Let's move on where we can just sit and shoot the bull all day, but let's show stuff. Um, this is a report prepared by the uh, Maritime Museum, which I played a small part in. I'm very proud of it. Um, this is actually developed um, for the American uh, Battlefield Protection Program. They're a division of the National Park Service. The Maritime Museum is actually able to secure a grant from them. Um, my understanding is they were developed mainly to take care of land battle sites. And with, with this uh, Valcor site, it's, it's kind of new, it's an underwater site, but we, they were able to secure a $20,000 grant from them, uh, which made this possible. Having the objects conserved, uh, being able to have them interpreted, and, and putting this all together. Um, and it's also prepared for the Naval Historical Center. Um, who we also get uh, permission from. We got the permission from to raise these objects because they're actually, uh, by law, they're, they're naval um, artifacts or naval property, and we have to actually have to get permission from them to, to recover these things. And also from the New York State Museum, who's also in charge of, of objects of historical significance that are on state lands. Um, and being that the lake is you know, a state land, it's submerged, they still have uh, the authority and the responsibility of making sure that the items that are there 
um, are protected and that we, we learn as much about them as we can for an educational purpose and scientific purpose. Great. Um, and this was put together by the Maritime Museum. This is actually a draft report uh, that covers 1999 to 2001. Uh, we're going to do a finished report in the coming year that will encompass 2002 also uh, and have a finished document for them. Um, and what this actually does is it uh, talks about the Champlain Valley, its, its importance in uh, American history. Um, and it starts out, and there's some uh, depictions here that they use of the history of Lake Champlain right from the start with uh, Champ, uh, Champlain. Um, you want to pick it up? Oh, okay. okay. With Champlain uh, actually discovering the lake and his, the role he played with the natives. Um, right on through. Uh, That's a sketch that Champlain drew himself, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is a sketch of uh, later developments on the lake. This is Crown Point. It goes right through the history of French and uh, English uh, development on the lake and the conflicts that ensued right up to the American Revolution with Benedict Arnold and uh, the Battle of Alcor Island, um, which also um, brought us right to the doors and the walls of uh, Quebec City um, the year before. Um, and again, this is all to develop the information of the role of Champlain Valley during the American Revolution, which was, uh, it was a major and very important um, part of the American Revolution. It was America's back door, and it was something that had to be uh, well guarded and, and taken care of. Um, and they've also have some depictions here of, the, of the, the running battle, which took place two days after the Battle of Elkhorn Island, where the Americans were actually being pursued down the lake, and Benedict Arnold took the opportunity to delay them a little more and take another couple shots. Um, and what this is, this is also a depiction of uh, the last missing gunboat from that uh, engagement. This is a Spitfire that the Maritime Museum uh, discovered during a side scan sonar survey in, I think it was 1997. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's an integral part of this whole thing. The Valcor Bay Research Project is connected to that. We're still trying to, or the Maritime Museum is still exploring possibilities of, of what should happen with this, whether, whether this should be conserved and raised or uh, uh, what other options might be available for it in its future. Um, a sister ship, the Philadelphia, is currently in the Smithsonian. And uh, it'd, be, it'd be quite something to have something like this on display in the North Country. So maybe that's something they'll develop in the years to come. Uh, and then it goes on and it talks about the project itself. Uh, this is uh, a depiction. We're on uh, Dr. McDowell's lawn right on uh, uh, <laughs> Valcor Bay itself. He's offered his, uh, his home, his uh, camps for us. Uh, we actually have um, uh, two weeks we do each August as a, as a group effort um, to get the conservators uh, from the Maritime Museum. And actually, we've got conservators from uh, Fort Ticonderoga and from other parts in the country that have taken part of it. And here we're actually doing a dry run of the survey on the ground so we can get everybody acclimated to the uh, systematic work we do underwater. It's a little harder to communicate down there. Yeah. And uh, get everybody with the program so we can actually put it together. Um, and uh, this is a depiction here of one of our divers, Phil Marsh, and this also shows us this basically how we go about this. And, the safety features that we use, we all use pony bottles, which are redundant air supply. So if we have somebody that has a problem with their main um, air supply system, they have something else to work with. Uh, and that's the one thing that we want to make sure that we do is uh, we want to maximize our ability to explore why we're down there, but we also want to make it as safe as we can. We don't want anybody to get hurt in this process. And that's where the Maritime Museum is, is coming very handy because uh, uh, all of their uh, underwater conservators are also dive instructors and uh, very well equipped and uh, informed to keep us all safe. Um, and it also shows how, how we go about our work. A lot of this has been through um, the volunteers. This, this here is the uh, boat, uh, Southern, actually it's Northern Comfort, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Steve Nye's boat. Um, Steve's offered it to us in the past. It's been a great platform to work off of. Uh, and this is a Maritime Museum boat here that we've worked off of. And uh, then we actually go into 
the results of what we've what we've done. This is actually a, these are all 50 foot grids that we've done here. Uh, and this was up to 2001. We've actually done several since then. We've actually gone to the west. Uh, so far, we've done about 120,000 square feet of survey. And inch you by really? Inch. That's amazing. Um, and this initial area was in the center was where the, we found the gun and the muzzle and the debris from the cannon site. Now we're working away from that. Uh, and as you saw on the map in the other room there, um, the American line was pretty static. It didn't move much. It basically sat there and wanted the British to come to them. So now we're de developing patterns of shot through our work and we're, we're pretty certain that's going to lead us to locations of where other vessels were. Um, and that's something that we're currently putting together now. And here's some more shots. Um, Jerry Forkey has not only been a diver for us, uh, he's been great, a great eye for us with photographs. Uh, he's basically took it upon himself and has done a wonderful job and most of his pictures are used in, not most of his pictures, but many of his pictures are used uh, in the exhibit itself. He's done a wonderful job of putting things together and hope we'll have an opportunity to talk to him about his work here shortly. Um, but he's basically documented the, the, our work as it, as it went on and without him, that's uh, definitely something we wouldn't have to show you. And we wouldn't have an exhibit here um, to show you either. Um, this is, is uh, we've actually had a man from the Office of General Services, uh, Richard Bennett. He's a surveyor. He came out and actually did uh, GPS readings. We'd have a diver on the bottom with a buoy and uh, marking specific spots. And he actually put our grid map onto an actual map um, within, within tolerances of a meter. So oh, we're, that's pretty good. We're, we're gonna, yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> that's we're gonna, amazing. That's the one thing we've been able to do. A lot of the value of this material is not only what it is, but where it is, because yes. from there we can determine where boats might have been or where um, events might have taken place. And this ties it all in, and we can draw a lot of uh, conclusions from what we find on the bottom. And this is actually the grid system where um, he's actually five points that we had and then superimposed those points right onto the map for us. And it was also a check for us because it's, it's hard to get these grids square and we wanted to see how we were doing. And actually we're, we're falling within the one meter tolerances that he's coming up with. Great. So it's, a, it's meticulous, difficult work, but it's, a, it's rewarding and it's, it's, it's nice to see that this is working out as well as it is. And then uh, this report goes into the artifacts themselves and what they were able to conclusions they were able to do with that also. There's great draftsmen at the Maritime Museum, drew all these to scale, uh, and it's a, it's a permanent record. It's something that we're going to have. And, and, um, there's, there's also photographs that accompany it with, as far as how these items were conserved. And uh, um, this here is the, uh, the face of the cannon after conservation. They're actually able to see some, some markings on it. Um, and we're able to expose those. and try to learn from those. And what we're finding out is that that's probably an inventory number that was scratched on the face that of it. it. Yeah, I wonder. Um, it wasn't, they don't believe it was something that um, was there at the time that the cannon was cast. It was actually chiseled in later on. It might mm -hmm. have been a way for them to uh, just keep track of which gun was where. Yeah. And uh, Chris Fox, a conservator from, uh, well, he's actually the director of the Fort Tye Museum. He's also an uh, underwater archaeologist, um, came out and helped us out. And this is the, another piece of cannon that we've discovered since we've raised these pieces. We've actually found three more pieces. Um, we believe we have about 80% of the cannon now. Um, I th I, my personal feeling is I think we got a little more than that. But uh, we got some more work to do and we got some more pieces to find. I know that. Um, and then right down the shot. There wasn't a whole lot that they didn't include in this. Uh, this is a piece of bar shot um, that's actually here on display. Uh, this is a cartridge pouch, all the components of the cartridge pouch, the leather cover, uh, the wood block. That's here, and we'll show you that. Uh, bayonet that was discovered, um, and that's also here. We'll be showing you that. And uh, this was a sword that was discovered by Phil LaMarche. Um, this is we found in the meantime since um, I talked to you last. Mm -hmm. um, this is yet to be conserved. Um, 
that's something that we're hoping is going to be happening within the next season or two. And then uh, from all that work that we did and actually mapping this out, um, this is um, what Adam Kane was put together with all the information on the, the different objects that we were finding. And I think I showed you the last time, I'm not sure, about how we were able to actually determine mm -hmm. where the New York um, was during this engagement um, by, where the, by where the muzzle fell. And from the debris that was around it, we were also able to plot the movement of the ship itself and uh, see how, this, how the ship actually probably swung on an anchor. And when it did, they threw portions of the gun and debris off of the boat. And actually, um, once we found out what boat we had, we knew it was a sister ship of the Philadelphia, of which we had plans for. We were able to plug that right into this scale diagram and have it just fit perfect right in there. Um, so we're, we're pretty confident about how the, the way the ship moved during the battle. You know, it's truly amazing that you, you are rewriting the history book. Nobody was there to take a video when this battle occurred. Right. So you have to painstakingly try to reconstruct it as the experts did for the Battle of Plattsburgh when they laid out that giant grid on the floor of the gym. But it's, it's different for you because you're right down there. Right. And it, it, it is a connection to the past. I mean, you get that sense. You get that feeling. How can you help uh, it? Right. Um, I don't know if we're, if we're rewriting history. I think we might be helping augment it. Well, um, explaining it. Re exactly. I mean, I, because before you started this project, n n it wasn't written down anywhere exactly how, no. how um, this occurred. But one, there, there were some things that were written by different people regarding this, and that's what we're finding in pension records now of, of this cannon exploding and it affecting several people. Yeah. Benedict Arnold himself wrote to, I think it was Schuyler, saying how all the officers on the New York had been killed except for the captain. Well, this cannon is, is probably a good contributing factor to that. We know it killed one of its lieutenants. I would think so. Um, and it was, it was definitely a traumatic event. There's no doubt about it. And, you know, unfortunately for them, but fortunate for us, it, it left a trail there. And it is. It's like reconstructing an accident scene. It's still there. It's been waiting. It's been well preserved by the sediment. It's just a matter of putting the pieces together, putting it with the, the written documents, and drawing conclusions from that. Um, and I told you that uh, a lot of this information we were able to develop was through pension records. Well, Jim Millard has given us the opportunity to put this story on um, the internet. And a, a gentleman had done some research on his great-great-grandfather, Daniel McKay, who had spent eight years involved with the revolution. He was an immigrant from Scotland and fought for the Americans. And uh, he did some research on him and kind of plugged into um, the different places that he had stated he had been. And one of them was Lake Champlain. So he punched in Lake Champlain on his computer and was brought right to the Valcour Bay Research <laughs> Project. Isn't that great? And uh, he was able to read about the story of the cannon, the cannon exploding, and was able to see, you know, the results of a pension record of, uh, of um, Jonas Holden, who explained that, you know, the cannon exploded and it killed this fellow townsman, Lieutenant Thomas Rogers, and he had just read the, his uh, pension record of his great-great-grandfather and said, gee, the story is significantly similar. And, uh, <laughs> is it? This is just, this is the neat part of it for me. This right. is just like magic. And this is uh, actually, this is, um, what would happen is veterans would have to come into a pension officer and explain how they were injured during their service and uh, why they couldn't, you know, perform certain duties now, like with Daniel McKay, he couldn't work his farm. Um, and he's applying for a pension, so he has to describe in detail to a pension officer what happened to him. And uh, he explains this to a pension officer, and then the pension officer makes a written record. And this is the, the part, a uh, uh, section of that, that uh, came from that. Uh, he further states he was frequently sent on small detachments from the regiment. Once was ordered on Captain John Reed's gunboat on Lake Champlain. John Reed was the captain of the New York. So we know from this that it's the New York that they're talking about. One of the guns on the boat burst and tore the opponent from right hip almost to the navel. The wound was sewed up and healed so they could perform his duty during the war. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> Picture this, can you? Right, oh, and it just man. shows you the, how, how tough these men really were. Oh, my, my, um, my. And what we did, Jim Millard saw the opportunity. We offered 
This is a, a Dr. Myron Smith. He's a retired pathologist from Colorado. Uh, Daniel McKay's uh, descendant, and we gave him the opportunity to uh, put the story on the, the website, and he has. So it's it's just another way to document this whole story. It just keeps it just keeps going. It's just a story that was waiting to be told, and it's just incredible how things have developed it's, since. Yeah, the story is in there, and all you have to do is unlock the doors. That's right, and. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of people, a lot of really great people have taken part in this, and it just it keeps going. Who knows where it's going to go? Well, this is, this is true of all kinds of history because the, those people who wrote these documents, like, like this one that was uncovered, you know, there, there are details left out along the way. Right. And many people who were involved in making history, as we're doing, sitting here in this room today, just don't realize how it's going to be viewed 100 years or 200 or 226 years from now. So they may not record everything. And so that's right. why it's up to people like you and all of your friends here to just get the other little tidbits to add to the mix. And sure. every time I talk to you, there are new chapters. How much longer is this project going to be underway? Oh, I, there, I don't, there isn't just, any like end date. I think it's something that can just an open. I think it's thing. something our, our grandkids could do if they wanted to. Just continue, um, huh? Oh, there's a lot of work there. And uh, we've got a lot of people, a lot of dedicated people that are, you know, and that's a thing. It's a volunteer thing. So we've got people that give time when they can and do what they can. Um, but there's a lot of work to do there. There's years and years of work to do there. Um, we actually have three groups of people now that are three type dive teams that are actually oh, putting this together. Right. Uh, we have uh, Dennis O'Neill and Greg DeRocher. There are a couple divers that have been... Um, working the west end of the American line. We have Tony Tiro and some people involved with him that have been working the British line. Uh, Roger Harwood, who works with Dennis and Greg, is, is here and he can tell you a little bit uh, about their experiences. Um, so we've got a lot of people working together on this and we're all working together in concert with the Maritime Museum and with New York State and the, you know, the, the federal authorities to bring this thing together. And it's, it's something that should be preserved and um, explore to whatever extent we have possible. And it pleases us that you're willing to share your progress with us from time to time. I think it's just terrific that on 24-hour notice he got down off his roof decided <laughs> <laughs> to bring these people together today. Yeah. I want to mention our friend Gary Chartrand who's a kind of an avid collector of uh, old-time newspapers connected with Lake Champlain, the Battle of Plattsburgh. He's gone I don't know to what lengths to collect hundreds and hundreds of photographs I don't even think he owns a computer, does he, Calvin? Mm -hmm. he, he has sources. You and I would go on eBay to look for this stuff, and he would go call somebody up or read somebody that might have it. So this is, uh, we've talked to John about this, and we've been looking at this picture, uh, this page that it says dates back to uh, October 27, 1776. Um, John thinks this might be a recreation of an original document that was reprinted perhaps a hundred years later in 1876 as part of a volume. We haven't done all that much research, but even if it dates from 1876, it's still a piece of history, isn't it, Ed? Well, I would think so. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Actually, this is the first time I've seen it oh, really? uh, this morning. Yeah, um, we, had, we had to kind of get John to go upstairs and find it somewhere. We'll have to get John to talk to us about it, too. Um, yeah. But anyway, I think that's what it is. I think it's a, it's a newspaper article um, from Philadelphia about the, the events that happened at Belcor. Well, that's another piece of the puzzle that we'll, oh, we'll sure, add certainly. to the mix and talk about. Certainly. we got so much to do and so much to talk about today. We're going to continue onward uh, and just see if we can fill some more blanks in in your own minds about what happened on those fateful days around October 11th, 1776 on Lake Champlain for the Battle of Valcourt. Stay tuned. Once again, we're inside the Clinton County Historical Museum on Court Street in Plattsburgh talking with uh, State Police Diver Ed Scullin, who's dedicated a huge portion of his life to this project, um, which is rediscovering some of the events and artifacts connected with the Battle of Valcor in October of 1776. This is quite a map. Yeah, this is actually a, a contemporary depiction that was in uh, uh, a British uh, newspaper shortly after the battle. 
um, which actually showed and it's we're finding that it, it's pretty accurate as far as how the, the battle was be, uh, depicted as far as where the ships were um, and actually this is what I went by uh, when I wanted to make that connection to the past um, to try to find the American line and I'd actually tried finding the British line first didn't have much luck the first day I tried the American line I found this portion of this cannon so um, it's uh, it's pretty interesting how it's panning out and as I mentioned we also have uh, um, Dennis O'Neill and Greg DeRocher that are um, working on another section of the American line and we're finding that the American line does drop to the west just like this um, so we're finding that this map is is very accurate and it's also helping us in which areas we think we should explore for young school kids and for some older people who may not may not have paid much attention to the history of the of the United States until now based on some of the scant information they get in their textbooks in school and we're going to change that if we have anything to say about it let's explain once again the the basic purpose for the battle of Valcor and what how what its significant was well Lake Champlain was it was a the easiest way to get into the interior of the United States um, and throughout American history before we were Americans in the uh, French and Indian War um, and Samuel Champlain's exploration of the, the lake, the lake was the easiest way to get into the interior of the country. So it was, it was like the uh, I-87 of uh, <laughs> uh, the I 15 like and 1600s. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think I stole that from our coin. Oh, you did? Um, <laughs> I won't tell him he said that. <laughs> yeah, he'll find out. But anyway, um, what had happened is the Americans realized this, and the British had, had, and so did the British, and the British had concentrated so much of their effort on the problems in Boston that they basically left the back door open. And the Americans in 1775 were easily captured Fort Ticonderoga. They captured uh, Crown Point. Uh, they even captured Montreal. They got to the right to the walls of Quebec, and they didn't. They didn't make it. They didn't uh, catch Quebec. Uh, and they were also trying to gain Canadian support, uh, and that fell through. And uh, in 1776, the British sent reinforcements, and the Americans were fleeing down through the lake. Well, once they got to the lake, the Americans. Uh, basically destroyed any ships that they had that they couldn't take with them and uh, during the summer of 1776 the British had to spend considerable time um, putting together a fleet what they actually did is they took several of their ocean going vessels apart dragged them across land and put them together at St. John for uh, deployment on the lake um, and so just the existence of the American fleet and the absence of theirs bought the Americans considerable time during the summer of 1776. Um, it didn't look like the British were going to make an appearance in 1776, but in October they did. And uh, Fort Ty wasn't ready to receive them yet. And uh, the American fleet was much smaller, didn't have the capability of traveling as fast or as quickly as the British. Um, so Arnold saw that his really own option was to remain in hiding until the British came and then he could engage them and, and try to inflict as much damage upon them as he could and slow them down. And that's actually what the Battle of Valcour did. It was a, um, the fleet, the American fleet was pretty much destroyed out of 15 vessels. Only four of them made it back to Fort Ty. The New York, the ship that we're going to be talking about through here, was the only ship of its type that made it back of the hmm. Americans. Um, but basically what he did is he sat in waiting and used Valcour Bay and the North Wind at his advantage and he made the British uh, attack him and come to him. And the problem that the British had is they had to tack for, for a ship to get back up against the North Wind. They'd have to tack back and forth into the wind and at that time they'd have the whole American fleet in a strong line uh, and they'd be exposed to the full fire of the American line. So the Battle of Valcour was important in that it, it bought more time for the Americans um, and it also showed their resolve to defend their position. So when it came time to uh, um, the British coming down to uh, um, Fort Ty, they knew they were going to get a flight. And with it being that late in the year, they decided to spend it to the next year. And in that time, the Americans bolstered their forces, and at Saratoga were able to defeat the British at Saratoga in 1777 and gain the support of the French, which also led to the, you know, 
ultimately to the Americans winning the war. That's a great overview. And to let our viewers know once again that this is based on contemporary sketches that were done by an officer on the spot. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then look at Valcor. Heel de Valcor, almost one rock. And that's pretty much what it is. Isn't that neat? And uh, the contours of the island are, are pretty accurate. And I was looking at that in the beginning. I was like, geez, you know, if the, if the contours are accurate, then, then maybe the lines are. And I, I think they and are. They were pretty close. Yeah. That's great. That's a good place to start. All right, let's move over here and uh, look at some of the displays. This, uh, just to see how this is set up is overwhelming. This is really neat. Right. How this is set up initially, how it's all with the sta stanchions here, which I thought was a great idea. The, the Maritime Museum and their uh, crew came up with this idea. This is basically how we, we do our grids. We set these PVC posts into the, the silt on the bottom. It's so deep and it's so thick that it holds these posts and it allows us an opportunity to set up lines and, and do uh, really accurate grid work. And uh, that's what they decided to frame this all in, or these um, posts very much along like the ones we use to uh, to do our work. So when you talk about 50 foot squares, this is how they're set up. How it's set up, right. These bigger posts are on the corners and these smaller posts um, go in between and we actually string a line in between. We'll go up the line with the metal detector. It's, it's a visual guide for us so we don't miss an inch. Uh, we cover every area, every inch of it uh, thoroughly, systematically, and then we're also able to plot it uh, exactly where it sits. Uh, this is a, a depiction here that they uh, um, this is actually something I put together for the report um, that they've used here. It explains how it's set up and how it works. Everything is carefully designed so that you don't miss too much. As Ed described last time, and I think we should point out again, when you find something, you call it an anomaly. Right. With a metal detector, right. you don't start getting your shovels and hands down there and digging right away because that would upset what you were doing that day, right? Well, right, and plus it's, uh, the, the silt is so fine that it, when you disrupt it, your visibility yeah. becomes almost nothing. Um, so if you were going to start digging on these things or start removing the overburden of sediment, um, you'd silt yourself out, you wouldn't be able to see. So what we'll actually do is set up a series of posts where we have the anomalies, and once we're through surveying the grid, we'll come back and we'll investigate what's there uh, record what's there, and it stays there until we're ready to have it conserved. I was reading some of the information on the web last night about how, what it feels like to reach down in there and try to determine what the object is with your hand at first. Right. It's, uh, and actually, I find what's probably the better thing to do is just fan this stuff away and keep going. It's much slower and it takes a lot longer, but if it's something that's uh, uh, fragile, like this cartridge box here, it's not something you're not, you're not going to impact it in any way that's going to be detrimental. Well, what, uh, generally, what's in this display? Let's just describe um, to people what we have here. Most of what we have in this display is what we came across um, from 1999 uh, and 2000 and was actually raised on a, a, a ceremony in June of 2001 and it, it spent a better part of 2001 being conserved was actually put on display at the Maritime Museum throughout most of 2002 and it came over here for the uh, 226th anniversary of the battle. Um, and John Tompkins and uh, Jerry Forkey and a few other people went through a lot of work. Um, Matt Booth, um, Bill Leach, to get this up and running along with people from the Maritime Museum and we're glad they had the opportunity to do that. Um, cause it's a great display and they've put it together very well and this room is perfect for it. It's going to be here until October of uh, next year, and then it's uh, probably going to go to the uh, uh, Naval Historical Center in, in uh, Washington, where it'll be on display there. I told somebody last night that I was coming here today, and they say, oh, is that open to the public? It's, uh, <laughs> I have to tell people that this is our Clinton County Historical Museum. Right. There are hours when it's open to the public. We wish it were open more hours on weekends right. and evenings right. and so on. And, and we're going to see what we can't do to, to make it more available. Um, that's something that we're working on now. Their, their staff is only so big and they have only so much time to work with. Um, what we're actually looking at doing is getting some of the divers in here, some of the volunteers in here uh, on weekends so that uh, people can come in and see it and they can actually have a diver here to talk to them about it and give them a little more insight to what's, what they're actually looking at. I'm sure they'll have many, many questions when they come here. You have photographs, you have the actual objects. This. Uh 
this pouch, to me, when I saw it on your slides last year, I thought that was pretty neat. Now right. to see it in, in person, that is so incredible. Right, and it, uh, that was actually sent to uh, Texas A&M, if I'm not mistaken, for conservation. Um, and uh, made it back in time for the display. All the, all the flint is on the bottom, uh, the shot that was in it. Um, the shot would have been set up like this with this paper cartridge here and placed in these holes in the box. I see. Over the years, um, the shot and the powder had disintegrated. Um, but everything else was there. This buckle um, was actually part of it. And you're able to determine from holes in the block that it was actually waste worn. Um, and you can see how it's set up on over this on the far uh, corner, I right see. on this silhouette over here. How it would have been worn? It would have had a shoulder strap, and that probably was linen, linen, and that deteriorated over the years also. Um, but this buckle would have been on that strap just to cinch it up and make it tight to the wearer. And you can actually see the imprint of it in this cover where it actually oh, laid yes. on top of it. Oh yeah. Um, so that was something that most likely was. You know, a result of the explosion, it was a piece of equipment that, that flew off one of the men and just rested there and waited. Uh, well, it was 225 years uh, before we had it conserved. Uh, this is a belt axe um, on the bottom corner here. Uh, this would have been used as a camp tool, also would have been used as a weapon, as it had to be. Uh, and this is a bayonet. One of the neat things we found out about this, the conservators found out about this, was it was actually pretty poor choice for a bayonet. It was one that had been used before. Oh, and it really? actually had been pounded flat for some reason. It must have been damaged or something of that sort. But it just shows that uh, it's, a, it's another um, way of showing just how dire situations were for the Americans. They didn't have the equipment they needed and they had to use what they could make do with. And they had to use things that uh, were, you know, probably used during the French and Indian War. This anchor here is, uh, is a French anchor. So oh, yes. yeah, so that was something that they um, was in the middle of the site. We were kind of wondering whether it was involved in this or not. Uh, we think it probably was. It was just something that was reused um, because they just didn't have enough. And we can tell that from historical records too, where Arnold is is writing saying we don't have enough shot, we don't have enough powder, we don't have you know the line we need for our sails. Um, so they were trying to get this stuff together to get the American forces to where they could deal with the British. I think it's a good point to. Uh to let our viewers know that what you're doing over this long project in the Valcor area is also cleaning up the, that portion of Lake Champlain. When the metal detectors go over, metal detectors are very good at detecting things like bottle caps and pull tabs yeah. and beer cans beer, and beer cans, cans and things that are thrown or, or yeah. fall inadvertently over the sides of right. boats and vessels. Um, and that can slow you down, but you've got, a, you've got a ton of that stuff out of there already, haven't you? Right, but uh, actually I, I think it's, it's actually pretty clean. And I, I, you know, we had some people kind of get a bad rap about Champlain is dirty and it's not well taken care of. It's it's not that bad, I don't think. I mean, really? there's there's some work that we need to do, but uh, all the diving I've done around Valcour, you know, you're going to find your beer cans here and there. But as far as there being lots of debris lots. there, there isn't. Well, that's good. Okay. Yes. We we try to promote that. So, yep. So these soldiers weren't having Genesee. Those cans were from this battle. Then, right? Not as far as we know. No, Genesee wasn't part of the picture. This is a very fine display, absolutely beautiful, gives people a general idea of how the, how the project is undertaken and well, some of the first. One thing fruits. I think is really neat about this is they've set this cannon up uh, as it would have been had it been whole. So you, you see the pieces that are missing. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's, there's three more pieces that we found. Um, and this cannon, the markings on it, unfortunately, didn't tell us a whole lot. Um, they had what they called cartouches, which were... Uh, emblems of the king or something of that sort, it would help identify it. This didn't. Um, and the, the area of the vent field that we found where the cartouche normally would have been, there's nothing there. It was, a, it was basically just a uh, utilitarian cannon. It was made to function as a cannon, it wasn't made to be pretty, um, but the Philadelphia that they recovered from the Valcor Bay in, in the early 30s uh, had guns similar to this on it. And they were able to trace the origins of those, and they were Swedish made. Oh. Uh, and they were 17th century, late 1600s, these were made. So at the time of, the, of this battle, this gun was already 100 years old. 
um, and had probably seen a lot of action. And Fort Ty is most likely where it came from, and it had changed hands several times. Some of the forts, the fort at times had been burned, so who knows what had happened to this cannon uh, that might have led to it being weak and exploding, but that's exactly what happened. But it's pretty neat, and I don't know if Calvin can do this, but they've got this set right up. Uh, so it's just like it would have been. You can look right up that muzzle and you can see right into the, uh, the bore of the cannon just like uh, it would be if it was whole. <laughs> we got him down on the floor with the camera. We may have to dial 911 to get him back out of there, but we'll get an idea what it's all about. Calvin mentioned that an aside while we were getting him in place for this interesting shot. Um, you could get a mixture of eras when you're d getting artifacts off the bottom of the lake or anywhere else. If you're if you're doing it on land, you're bound you're bound to get some other things mixed in. And Calvin said, "Yes, you made an educated guess about this anchor." Right. Uh, but there might be other things that you would discover that were from another time period. Oh, uh, that's quite possible. Uh, actually, uh, Dennis and uh, Greg and uh, um, Roger Harwood here have also found this this really neat. Uh, um, it's it's uh, it's a boat. It's a it looks like it's it's got a uh, frame that's wood, but it's got like this tin outside to it. It's a very old boat. I, Roger can tell you more about that. That's there. Oh yeah, and we that's will. significant on it. That. That's significant in itself, and that's from you know a later time. So who knows what we'll uncover? It's, it is an educated guess that this this is uh, part of the uh, debris from the. Uh, Revolutionary battle. There was a French and Indian battle not far from Valcour, in between uh, the Valcour site and the uh, uh, Battle of Plattsburgh site. Um, so it is possible that the French might have been in there and dropped this anchor in, in the same spot. But uh, the way it's situated with uh, the debris and stuff, we actually think it might have been deployed by either the New York or uh, a small vessel that uh, assisted it. Um, well, I mean, like everything else, you know, things around my house uh, aren't all purchased within the last six months or two years. And many times, we, you know, I'll go out in the garage and grab a saw that's a, a hand saw that's 100 years old right. to do a job. And these guys had to use whatever they had at hand. Yeah, and they were, and, and the New York was the last, uh, the vest, vessel, is, uh, I'm pretty certain, that was outfitted uh, that was actually part of the engagement. Um, so they were the very last to use any of the equipment that they had left over. Um, and as I'll show you with the portion of the carriage here, we even think that this carriage had to be modified to fit this gun. Um, but as long as I have Calvin down there, this is where that, that marking is. Um, and what it has is, is number XII, number 12, and it's probably an inventory number. And these, num these letters were chiseled, and this actually the, the zero for the number uh, was actually part of a stamp. Um, but they believe that was put on much later, and it wasn't uh, part of the, the cannon's original markings. But once again, that's an educated guess, because uh, I, they must have seen other cannon with inventory numbers maybe stamped on. And right, right. Maybe that's and where that idea came from. The thing that's helped us uh, a great deal is that we've had Chris Fox um, with, with Fort Ty, and they have several cannons of this type. Um, and he's been out there with us, so when we come across something, if we're not quite certain what we're dealing with, he's, he's a great uh, resource to have available to us. He can tell us you know, what these things are and what they might be part of. With the beauty of the Internet and various other means of modern communication, I'm sure this Valcor Bay project will attract attention of experts all over the world. Well, we hope so. Uh, and I, I believe we've already, we, we have several experts that are working with us now, and uh, They've contributed greatly from what we've been able to learn from this so far. And there's a lot more to learn yet. Um, we've, Like I said, we've only just scratched the surface of that bay. And I'm sure there's a lot more there to be discovered and be interpreted. Thank goodness we do have the resources to accomplish something like this room today. In the past, that might not have been possible. And I want to say another word, another positive word about being able to conserve the artifacts. Because in the past, many of the items were brought up and tragically deteriorated right. because they, they had been protected, in a sense, by where they rested for 200 years. Right, and that's the thing. Uh, the bay uh, is, we've got levels of clay there that we've had 10-foot sections of this PVC pipe that I haven't been able to find a bottom to. Um, and it just encapsulates what's there. It keeps it from the oxi oxidation and deterioration and uh, 
this cannon is in the shape that it's in because it was protected by the, the clay. Um, the same with that leather cartridge box. It wouldn't have survived unless it had been encapsulated in that and protected from the water and from the, the oxygen in the water. We find, uh, just uh, as a point of information, we find an awful lot of uh, uh, an awful lot of cases where human remains are being found, being preserved by bogs and <laughs> and uh, certain conditions and desert conditions and so on, where mummies are preserved. So, yeah, the environment has a lot to do with it, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. And there's there's nothing to say that we might not come across remains here. So far, we haven't. Um, but we had 60 Americans that lost their lives in this battle, so it's quite possible. So it's, it's an area that you also have to treat with a great deal of respect because um, people did lose their life there. I think that doing programs like this and, and you're being so gracious to allow us to come in here and interview you and when you have many other things to do, and John for letting us in the building, will help to generate uh, an interest more of an interest in history that some people have taken. And I don't blame people individually for not paying attention to history. They're so busy trying to survive every day that they don't, they don't get the perspective of the past. But when they are titillated a little bit by seeing these items on display, maybe just maybe, uh, when they sit around their family unit for supper tonight or breakfast tomorrow morning, that they'll get a little conversation talking about it maybe get some more interest among the teachers you know in our in our schools to look at the history book and question what that writer said about little pieces of history and maybe get the the history to be updated by such things as as you've done here sure and I'm, I'm sure we'd love to have the opportunity to involve the area schools with this um, and that's something we can set up with the, uh, the historical association here we're going to actually have some uh, tours with the schools and get them through here and see it's this all stuff. part of it. Well, sure. I mean, you have to share this stuff. It's got to be shared. Oh, well, that's why it's here and that's a thing. And that's another thing about, about these artifacts. That if, if people were to bring them up and protect them and secrete them in their basements or where as else. As they used to do. As they used to do, nobody learns anything from it. Yeah. And it sits there. And after a while, people forget about it and they forget the context of where it came from. Um, and it just doesn't serve anybody. You know, a perfect example of that, Ed, is, is the cannon that were brought up right off Cliff Haven by a couple of teenage boys way back when, and I was so much a part of covering that, recording interviews and so on, and then looking at the frustration and anguish and legal battles that, that uh, evolved from that, just that event of a couple of kids finding cannon in Lake Champlain. Now we've learned so much from those experiences, haven't we? Right, and uh, I, th I think we've got a, 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 a good rapport through the Maritime Museum with both the state and the federal officials where everybody's working together and trying to do the best thing with this. Um, and of course you're gonna have issues of, of who has the uh, authority to authorize the removal of this or that or the other thing, but uh, that's part of the American way. You gotta. You know, you've got to have checks and balances and make sure things are done, uh, you know, for the good of everybody. It just pleases me to see such a wonderful display. Let's walk around the room a little bit more and, and just make the cook's tour. And uh, um, Up here on the wall is actually the, the grid pattern that we did up to 2000. We've actually have several more grids since then. Um, but they've actually put depictions of the, of the artifacts in roughly the area that they were discovered. Um, to kind of give you an idea, these are all 50-foot grids, so you're actually talking about an area that's probably about 400 feet by 400 feet here, um, and we've gone beyond that. Um, and again, they set this all up so you could um, see how this cannon was. Here's a, some other markings that we had found. This is called a trunnion. This would actually be uh, the support that um, mated the cannon with its uh, carriage. Um, that would have been a marking that we might have been able to find something out about, but unfortunately it had been damaged and, um, throughout its long life, and we haven't been able to draw any conclusions from it. We haven't found the other trunnion, which I think might have a date on it, stamped on it. Oh, that's, oh, wow. Um, so that's something that we're looking for. But one other neat thing about this was, and it showed how they had to make do with what they had, is we found these, uh, these pieces, uh, that U-shaped, uh, metal piece there. We're trying to figure out what that was, and what we actually think happened is they had a nine-pound carriage and a six-pound gun. The six-pounder is called a six-pounder because it would have fired six-pound shot. Um, 
this carriage that it was on was probably too big for it. So what they actually had to do was construct a piece that would mate the cannon to the bigger carriage. And it just, again, it's another demonstration of how dire situations were for them, how they had to make do with what they had. Um, and you said you found some new fragments for this cannon, right? Um, yeah, and actually, um, these pieces to the rear are the pieces that we think were thrown off the deck after the boat moved. Oh. And uh, what we think we've actually found, um, about 175, 200 feet away, are um, the vent field, which would have been where the touch yes. hole would have been, yep. the piece in front of it, and we believe we have this section here, and we believe they're where they're at because they were blown there by the explosion, um, almost oh. 200 feet away. Um, so so you, may, you may have way more than 80% of this cannon. Uh, it's, yeah, I think, I think we're, we're in that area or more. Oh, um, that's great. And again, those pieces are waiting to be conserved. And once we have them, we actually have sketches of them. And you can see um, how they're lining up with the sketches that we have, or actually the diagrams. They're not sketches anymore. They're, they're very accurate diagrams of how all this is going to fit together. And what we're missing is this left side and this left trunnion. And it might be that we might have to go back and tr retrace our steps and kind of look at some things over again here. Just may you better pray that your lungs hold out there, buddy boy. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. So far, so good. Um, Just a second. I'm Calvin's got a question. He always has a question. With that bowling ball been shot out of there. Um, that would have been right? actually that's a bomb. Uh, it would have been filled with powder. Uh, the wood plug that was in it for the fuse was inside of it. What happened was um, the water expanded the plug, and the plug went beyond the bore of the. Uh, of the ball and it actually sucked it inside. We actually recover it and conserve it. This would have been fired out of a mortar. Uh, mortars were like a big pot um, with powder and where a cannon would shoot a more direct line, a mortar would shoot the shot up high and, and it has, over. It was a very, very short bore, but a very big belly. Very big, yeah. Um, and this would have actually, they would have used these to go over the walls of forts or over moored ships. And they were meant to explode over the ships and, and spray the war, the forts, explode within the fort, catch the fort on fire, and, and spray the men with shrapnel. Um, this didn't happen with this. It hit the water before it, it ignited. So um, to the bottom it went, and there it stayed, and it, it went down there a ways. Um, and there's a piece of bar shot in the back that would have been made to rotate and spin and take out the rigging of the ships and disable the sails. Um, you can see where we found that down here. It was actually sort of position. And like I was saying before, when we find this, these shot and, and plot them out, you can actually get a trajectory and try to determine what they were shooting at and uh, maybe lead to the location of other vessels. And you might be able to find more debris that fell from the ships. So that's what we're working on now is we're trying to figure out uh, more locations. I think that'll happen. I think so too. Uh, and then, then we act, the display goes on where we actually have uh, the history of the project itself and the people that were involved. And as I said before, Jerry forkey has been uh, responsible for many of these photographs. Um, this is the, again, this is where we're doing our dry run on shore before our, uh, our annual two-week uh, um, sessions here. And this is actually doing the work. This was part of the uh, recovery of the artifacts in uh, 2001. And again, this is where we're using the surveyor to determine the locations of our uh, grid posts here on an actual map. And this is more of the story um, here and actually the history of Valcor Bay. This is the raising of the Philadelphia in 1935 by uh, Colonel Lorenzo Haglin. Uh, he actually toured Lake Champlain with that boat and had a hard time finding somebody that would take it. Um, Isn't it amazing? And it's now in the Smithsonian, and they actually built uh, this section of the museum around that, uh, around that vessel, and it's there now. What a great educational project to take your youngsters to go to the Smithsonian to see what our nation's heritage is and to see. Uh, there are several things from Clinton County and Upper New York State that are ensconced in the Smithsonian uh, Museum, the National Museum, so I would urge everyone who has the opportunity to go there. I know my kids who are in their 40s and 50s, uh, 
their, their golden memories are the times we spent traipsing through the Smithsonian and say, Dad, you're going to read that stuff all day? Come on. <laughs> But yeah, there's a lot the Philadelphia, read. that was such a big thrill for me to see it there. Right. And someday I hope to go there myself. I had not had the opportunity yet. Roger has, and he's told me about it and showed me some great pictures. So um, hopefully it's something I'll be able to see myself. Um, and over here, this is something that I was really impressed with. Um, we had found out the story of Jonas Holden through a pension record, a man being from Westford, Massachusetts who was injured by the cannon exploding. And he talked about his friend, Lieutenant Rogers, um, being killed by it. And a man named George uh, Quintel, a researcher, um, found that record. And he also found a record for a burial site for Lieutenant Rogers. Well, Lieutenant Rogers probably wasn't buried in West, Westford, Massachusetts. Uh, what this actually is, is, is a monument that was left to him by his wife. And, in trying to find out more about the Battle of Valcor, what we're actually finding out more about is the participants of Valcor. Now we're even finding out about their families. And, uh, That's wonderful. I'd, I'd have to say, out of all the connections I felt with this, I think probably the biggest connection I feel is with his wife, Molly. Um, Isn't that amazing? Aged 26 years and nine months. months. Right? Yep, and actually his, his wife was quite a woman. Um, at the time, she had... Uh, high infant mortality rate, she had already lost a child before he left for Lake Champlain. She was pregnant when he left. And uh, after he died, she bore and raised another child. And uh, on September 11th of 1778, uh, that child died. So within the span of three years, she lost her whole family. On September 11th? On September 11th. Isn't and, uh, unbelievable. We'll, we'll forever have a connection with September 11th. Oh, we sure will. <laughs> Today we're talking a lot more about October 11th and October 13th, but September 11th is now indelibly in, in inscribed on our minds. So every time we hear September 11th, it'll have a memory. Well, it, was, it was a defining moment in American history. Sure. And uh, it's defining because it basically shook people to their core. And when people are shaken to their core, that's what they react on. They react on... Uh, on their character, what's important to them as far as values um, and uh, the principles that they follow. And that's one thing where you, you saw all the great things that happened after September 11th, all the people that came together, how important service was, patriotism, you know, the influence of that coming back, people being able to see community and service and how important that was. In September 11th, 1778, here's Molly Rogers, who's, who's lost her family, and the one thing that she knows is, is very important to her is, is the, the service that her husband did, how important service was, community was, and, and, and the freedom of the human spirit. And that's what she wanted people to make sure of, is that anybody who happened to walk by and cast an eye would, would see the part that her husband played. And uh, fortunately for us, in modern days, with uh, the help of Jim Millard, we were able to show the world what his contribution was. Of course, back in those days, of course, communications weren't what they are today. That goes without saying. Today, we know, you know, the word of, of September 11th of last year spread like wildfire. Right. And everybody in the world knew about it in a, in a matter of moments and hours. In those days, it was different. Of course, it, this battle was significant to this woman and to the rest of their, his relatives, but a lot of people you know, the average uh, person who lived in, in the shadow of Lake Champlain wasn't always familiar with what was happening at precisely that time. They had, right. there were newspapers, but the reports were sketchy. They couldn't turn a radio on or listen sure. to a newspaper. So uh, in the Battle of Plattsburgh, for example, the, the general area knew what was happening because they watched, the, you know, things happen like in slow motion compared to today when the forces are forming up by the border and they stop on the way down and everybody's talking about it. The Battle of Valcor, I'm not sure. Well, first of all, we didn't have that many residents around here, right? No, no, we didn't. Not at the time. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a developed area. Um, and I haven't read too many contemporary reports from that time period, especially in diaries and things, so I really don't know what the local populace thought about that time period, but that's right. another avenue to sure. discover. Um, and she probably, didn't, she probably didn't learn of her husband's death until probably months afterwards, oh, yeah, well, either when he just didn't return home. Isn't, um, isn't that amazing? 
And uh, I just, like I said, I feel a bigger connection to her because you're actually able to find out a lot about her and just what she did here. And this, yeah. this stone is incredible. It's just, it, it looks, you know, it doesn't look like it's been sitting there for 225 years. It's really years. pristine, huh? And uh, they actually did this. I think this is silk screening. And what they, I, I went there and actually saw the stone myself and did a rubbing. And they took the rubbing and were able to do this. So this is a two-scale representation of that, that monument. Um, that's there in Westford, Massachusetts. And how neat that is to have it here. Right. Right. Um, and Ernie Haas, who has, uh, he did a, he's done several depictions of the Battle of Valcour. Um, the Philadelphia sinking, I think, is probably his most popular one. And I gotta tell you, that all the times that I've spent sitting on a boat waiting in between dives, trying to get a picture from what we've been doing and trying to figure out how things were and how things were situated, uh, this man has, has definitely studied the, the really? battle to a great extent and uh, I mean you couldn't imagine it any better than this He's, we've actually had the depiction of the gun exploding here um, aboard the gunboat New York uh, and the Maritime Museum commissioned him to uh, put this together for us that's great you can you can almost see action if you let your eyes wander a little bit and your mind wander oh you sure can al almost imagine what was happening just before the, these splashes, you know? Oh, yeah, and the thing that's kind of scary about this, too, is he, he's actually found a couple, uh, he's actually depicted a couple shots here before we actually found shot pretty close to that, so. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so maybe he's like, psychic uh, after uh, all, maybe huh? Maybe a little bit, uh, Isn't that but it's neat? pretty neat. Well, and of course, that would have happened, too. Um, the cannons weren't the most accurate thing, but, I mean, they, they got close or hit their target, so. Um, you know, it gives you an idea of what it would have been like to have objects like that flying at you from, you know, half a mile, a mile, maybe more away, and just uh, standing there and, and uh, trying to survive. Beyond belief for most of it. Oh, most of us, yeah. Okay, what do we got over here? Uh, and this is the, the story of the Battle of Alcor Island. These are contemporary images that, uh, or depictions, um, and it gives a little history of it. So you get a history of of the battle itself and of the project. And actually what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn you over to um, uh, Jerry Forkey. Jerry's responsible for a lot of this. Uh, they've also developed the project itself. And uh, Jerry has been just incredible for us with his, his talents with a camera. Great picture. And if I could, I'll have Jerry come up here and, and uh, over, Jerry. He's, explain he's what he's He's been standing in the here. background for since we started, and he's also been taking pictures to capture this for history. Right. How are you, my friend? I'm fine, thank you very much. That's great, thank you for being patient with us today. There's such a story to tell, and we don't want to leave any of these pages unturned because it's great. Just this, this you have to be pleased just with this batch of photographs. Look at the personality in every single one of those. Um, I'm very pleased. Um, I was, my, my favorite thing about photography is doing close-ups. Oh man! And uh, I love it. doing portraits is probably uh, my favorite thing. And the day I couldn't dive uh, for personal reasons, I took my camera. And after the first developments, uh, people liked what I did as far as the portraitures. And uh, from there, it uh, just kind of evolved. You know, pictures, pictures do capture. Good photographs do capture the essence of the subject matter. And look at Ed Scullin down here. Just take a look at this picture. Well, I bet you looking at that picture, you, you can recall what mood you were in at that moment, can't you? Well, actually, I don't remember exactly when oh, I took that picture. Oh, come on. You uh, blew my whole premise here. Actually, no, but well, that the is... thing is about Jerry is you, you don't see him with that camera. You really don't. You let your guard down, well, and he'll whole, take that picture. The of There's it. no fake in it. That's All beautiful. these things are candid. The, the best part about taking photographs is, I feel, is, is doing the candid shots where nobody's posing for it. So you get a more natural feel. And lucky that we don't have people with their mouths open or their <laughs> eyes, eyes closed and shutters do that, you know. You but, know, I uh, know so many of these people and, and you do manage to capture a, a great deal of who they are in those candid moments. But you I never, I, I, never smile. I never expected this to happen. Um, really? I was quite pleased when they said they wanted, wanted to use my photographs. Oh, give me so a I, break. I was really, I was flattered. These are classic photographs. They're, they're wonderful. Oh, we you. can look down through every one of the people we know and say, yep, that's them. I mean, if that doesn't describe Ed right there <laughs> in a jubilant mo moment for one reason or another, that is just absolutely fantastic. Uh, but this is a tiny, tiny sampling 
of how many photographs you've taken since you mm -hmm. first got involved. Exactly. I bet you haven't kept track, have you? Well, I, I know somewhere between four and five hundred. Are you kidding? No. Oh man. But it be, it's, it's, what it's become is a, is a chronology of all the events that our organization is is is, is done. So we can look back. We've been looking back uh, to 2000. Now, and we don't know what day, who was diving with us that day. Well, the pictures kind of show what, uh, who was there on that day. So I would like to think that someday, Jerry, the photo, just the photographs, could and with with their own little statements about each one, could become a separate uh, publication. But for all the photographs, four or five hundred. After the first dates and times. And oh, absolutely. After the after the first day, we found we just noticed the logistics of getting in and out of the water with a ton of equipment. It was phenomenal. I was so excited. I, I, I took a lot of a lot of shots, and and you look at it from the next day or a week later or two months later, you look back and say, "Wow, what an operation!" And this gives us that, that human touch to the whole whole operation. Uh, so it, and it, believe it, me, it, we're, it's actually turned out better than, than we expected or I expected. We all love photographs because that's one of the ways we have of, of capturing moods and events and so on. And still photographs tell a different story than, for example, videotape that we're taking today. And I know a lot of videotape has been also taken because we've seen that too. But we're also, at least I am, a student of the, the heyday of Life magazine and all the wonderful photographs, which I'm sure you've seen. Uh, at one time or another, and these are as good as any any personal photographs I've ever seen. Well, thank you very classic. much. So that's that's wonderful. I'm only one of the few contributing uh, photographers because they have a staff of two people I know at the Maritime Museum that took a lot of these shots from from their uh, from the museum itself and the preservation. So uh, I have a lot of the, the personal ones. So. Well, what what attracted you to this project besides the fact that you like to dive and take pictures? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's two very good reasons. Well, what happens when after Ed discovered the cannon, he put word out that he wanted some divers to help in the operation. And word came to me through Dan Carpenter, where I get my tanks filled at the Champlain dive shop, asked me if I'd be interested in becoming part of this archaeological exploration. And I said, absolutely. And uh, everything has just progressed from that point. But isn't it fun? Oh, it's, it's exciting. I mean, you, have you develop a passion for something, and it's not because you're getting any kind of remuneration. It's because when you get up in the morning, you say, boy, we're going to do it again today, and who knows what we're going to discover today. Let me ask a question uh, of Ed behind you or you, if you know the answer. Has National Geographic expressed any interest in this? Uh, we haven't reached out to them. And, uh I don't know. Maybe I'll make a phone call today. Yeah. <laughs> At some point in time, I bet you they would love to do a piece because they've right. done several, several right. full projects on uh, Lake Champlain sure. over 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 the sure. years. Um, and you know, this is a, this is a, a a loose effort, and as far as who's involved, but I mean, it is a collaborative effort of a lot of a lot of great institutions. So. Um, yeah, that'd be neat to put together. Well, you don't mind spreading the word throughout the North Country. Uh, via hometown cable, and we thank the other media, including the television stations and uh, and radio stations and newspapers f for following this project. But we'd like to see a little national and international exposure because it's that good, and you can't you can't keep things like this a secret for a very long time because this is so neat. Well, you can, you can talk to Roger Harwood; he's my agent. So that <laughs> <laughs> Roger, get over here. There are so many things to see and talk about, and you've been standing in the background very patiently over there, just coughing just loud enough so we knew you were there. I'm How sorry, I have a frog in my no, throat. No, I get but, frogs uh, in my throat all the time, and my frogs are bigger than your frogs <laughs> ever dreamed of being. This has got to be a tremendous kick for you. What, when did you start teaching? 1967. See that? And. Uh, 33 years later, We're I retired. We're in a special category here, um, Roger and me. Well, I was going to mention that. You know, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is kind of fun to have the kids let us play with them. Isn't it wonderful? And huh? if you look at the pictures. Boys with that, their toys. Uh, look at the pictures over here. Some of us are older than most. And uh, like Bill Leach and Tony Terrell. And um, after 30 or so years of diving, I took time out to build a house just about opposite this site. Oh, did you really? Right at the boat launch. And uh, so it helps. And it's, these guys have allowed us to, uh, 
to get into it and uh, it's a different life. It's a different world down there than we were normally used to. We used to dive up in the bay and, and we'd find cannonballs and, and I guess... And that and would be heard, neat in those you heard, days. You heard Ed talk about it. Um, we can't turn the clock back, but some history possibly was lost because uh, we don't know where that cannonball came from. <clears throat> and in some cases we don't know where it went. <clears throat> I remember pickup trucks heading from this side of the border up into Canada with scrap metal on board that right. consisted of artifacts off the bottom of Lake Champlain. And I cried then and I cry about it now. It's like somebody winning a political office going in and saying, we don't need all that Powell's papers in here. Take that stuff to the dump. That's a good example because it did happen here in the city of Plattsburgh at one time. And I'm not going to mention any names today, but those are things we cry about. Well, Frank Paps and I had that discussion last night, as a matter of fact. And, See, uh, we're, we're tuned in. And uh, now we're, I guess, more and more of us are getting on this page of, of uh, diving and, and the aspects and, and, and how this fits together. But it's been fun. Uh, and I found uh, that I can still contribute, and as some of these other older folks have. I don't have a metal detector, but I've learned that I can lay out grids and I can string tapes. And uh, it's about 50 feet of water, so it's acceptable uh, for those that, of us that kind of like easy diving. And uh, another factor that we have is, uh, is GPS now. We used to go up in the bay and we'd drive back and forth and we'd look at this tree or that tree and we'd try to see where were we the day before, where do we want to go today. And now, uh, and even this fall, I had uh, I went out a few times on the site. I'm I'm diving where Greg and uh, DeRocher and Dennis O'Neill uh, have uh, been working. To have the GPS in your boat, and you look down, and when the numbers are right, you drop your anchor, you go down Isn't the cool? line, and there's the post right there that you want it, to, where you want it to be. You go do your thing. You know in the back of your mind where that post was when you left it. You come back, there's your anchor, and you don't spend a half an hour or an hour running around the bottom or running around the surface trying to get back to your boat. And, uh, but being right there at the site every day, uh, because I live there, um, it's so easy. If the lake is calm and it's a nice day, you can scoot around there. And, uh, and Greg and Dennis also have their boats on, on uh, my dock, so it's, uh, they're making a contribution. Uh, and they found some neat things. Those things are still on the bottom. I, uh, I shared with you earlier uh, some of the things that, uh, that they found. Um, and hopefully, eventually, they'll come up. They'll be, uh, we'll be able to raise them, and they'll be part of the uh, further added to this exhibit. Um, but, um, and that's, that's our goal. You know, everybody that's a diver starts out looking for that little single thing. And, and one of the things Ed has done is to pull so many divers in the area together, more than anybody else ever has, to, to meet a, a, a single goal. It generated so much excitement. I mean, just in this room here today, I, as you were talking, I was thinking to myself how much I've learned about senior citizens once I became <laughs> one. And the tr <laughs> We don't have a choice. We can't help that. You know? <laughs> but you know what? I try to maintain the same passions that I had when I was 25 years old. It's just take, takes you a little longer to achieve your goals. But you know what? I think, Roger, you are an inspiration for other people who have lived around a long time and are not satisfied to sit in the old rocking chair because there is so much of the world to discover out there. What's what's a rocking chair? Yeah, what's a rocking chair? We've interviewed uh, dozens, literally dozens of senior citizens, some a great deal older, that's maybe hard to believe, than either Roger or myself, people in their 90s. We interviewed a lady during the past summer who lived in three centuries and celebrated her 104th birthday whose entire life was an open book. She had tremendous mental facilities and was able to describe what life was like in Peru in a one-room schoolhouse and teaching herself and driving to school with a horse and buggy and starting the fire and bringing the soup. And, and so uh, it's 
I think, a good time to point out that just because you're in your 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, you don't have to give up that great passion for life and learning. It's this, this project is doing that, and as, as there are people from all eight or, you know, many different age groups on, depicted on that, uh, on that uh, poster, and uh, it's brought a lot of people together. You gain, the older folks gain respect for what some of the younger ones are doing and, and vice versa. Um, Gordy, I wanted to mention that um, a few weeks ago I was watching a movie, and um, one of the fellows in that movie, they had some artifact or some bullet or something, and he said, uh, you know, you people don't realize what this really means. And one of the things this project has done for example, when, we would when I would find a cannonball in Plattsburgh Bay, it just was another cannonball. And now, to go down on this site, maybe it's because we get older we start to think more this way, but to, to go down on this site and find a piece of shrapnel from a ball, like this large ball that Ed uh, is displaying about, over here, not all of those balls hit the water whole. There are pieces of shrapnel as big as your hand. What was the message there? Why was that piece of shrapnel there? It was meant to do serious, serious damage to, to people. Um, yes, ships, but people were on those ships. And when you find musket balls, why are they there? You, you think about, and, you, and even when you find these, this was meant to do terrible damage to somebody. And, and so you have to, you know, you, you start to reflect on what this project is all about. Um, what's the meaning of, of, of these pieces? Um, and most of these things that, that are found there are things that were shot by the British. Except, you know, the, the cannon obviously wasn't. But there's another site out there that's, that hasn't really been discovered very much where there's probably nearly an equal amount of, of material. That, in other words, on the British, where the British ships were placed. Because, because we were doing the same thing to them. Maybe we weren't doing it as, as violently as they were to the Americans, but uh, there's, there's a, it's a, it's a, in the grand scheme of things, as you look at these maps, it's not a very big area. But when you're on the bottom and you're in a 50-foot box, <laughs> oh, yes. it's, it's, uh, it gets to be pretty large. And you think of the, the uh, huge number of grids that Ed and his crew have done over there. It's, it's amazing. a tremendous amount of work. Uh, I often dream of, we're, they're using metal detectors. I don't have a metal detector, but as I said, I can do some assisting. But <clears throat> hopefully, my dream someday would be for somebody to come up with a device, and, this, and, and, and you and I speculate on these things sometimes, for somebody to come up with a device that finds the rest of the story, that finds the wooden objects that have no metal in them, um, and whatever else, because basically all we're able to find are either are metal objects or objects that have metal attached to them, um, whether it be an anchor or whatever it is. So hopefully somebody will go back, not I'm sure probably in our lifetimes, somebody will go back, this research is done, somebody can, will do this with whatever and other that's what device I said, comes Because out. it's a never ending story, it will unfold as technology unfolds. When I first started diving mm -hmm. and started talking with guys like Frank Papst mm -hmm. and others in the old uh, uh, wreck raiders way yep. back a hundred thousand years ago, the, the the skills were rudimentary. The the diving gear was was certainly rudimentary you compared mean with two to hoses <laughs> that go like this. And uh, the ways of finding things were rudimentary. I saw you on television the other night talking about another one of your great passions, and that is it's, Crab Island. It's fun. And uh, you are almost single-handedly responsible for a lot of what's what's being done there. And I'm also old old enough to remember the history there and what the frustration we've gone through with, with that island, and I hope something comes up in the future. And there's still speculation as to whether those bodies should actually be discovered, and I know you have an opinion on it. Well, on, <clears throat> on the news the other night, uh, Tom Hollick said that not everybody feels the same way. Jim Millard, <clears throat> Jim Millard and I are great friends, 
but that's one thing we disagree on. Uh, not necessarily disagree, it just really doesn't matter to me. Um, they're there someplace, and um, my, my feeling is uh, they just need to be recognized. And the same with this project. It, it needs to be recognized for, for these kinds of things that happened uh, on that site, and, and the same at Crab Island. And uh, I spoke with Tom, uh, I heard you a minute ago say, uh, I spoke with Tom about National Geographic. And uh, maybe with everybody working together, uh, someday this this project will air on the on a on a national on a national level. I know there are a lot of people down there in Washington D.C. who know, but Lake Champlain exists up here because they're astute and they're concerned about the collecting things about the nation's history. And if they can go and uh, do do something on New Guinea, they can certainly come up mm -hmm. here and do another project on Lake Champlain. It's the way I look at it. Uh, a year ago. Uh, we traveled to Annapolis uh, for obvious reasons. Annapolis has the gun that uh, killed Downey uh, from the battle, in the Battle of Plattsburgh. It has the Philadelphia. Um, but when, <clears throat> when you walk in Annapolis and you walk in their uh, museum and you ask to speak to a curator and you say the Battle of Alcor, they know what you're talking about. Uh, and hopefully that this exhibit is, is going to travel to that area, to one of those venues, the, either at Annapolis or the uh, Naval Museum or uh, the Smithsonian. This, um, when we were visiting this, the uh, Philadelphia uh, at the Smithsonian, there's a huge blank wall right across from it that this, that. That, that this would be perfect oh. to, to have on. Uh, See how the man thinks? So that, you know, this has been great for me to, uh, being a very poor history student, um, and I've talked with some of my high school classmates about this, and they're just astonished that, how can you be so involved in history now? And, uh, yeah, join the uh, club, I feel exactly the same way. It's, it's been fun, and Jim, and, Jim uh, Millard and I have gone back and forth so much, uh, and he's been a real ins inspiration to, uh, to me to be involved and in, in to this project. You know, Ed, it, it, it just, just talking with Roger, it makes me feel as though uh, I'm realizing the importance of gathering a very diverse cross-section of people when you start a project like this. You don't need only divers. You don't need only historians. You need photographers. Right. Sometimes you need doctors. Sometimes you need uh, lawyers. But, mm -hmm. so, you know, the larger the group, the, uh, of uh, the diverse talents, the better likely you are of having ultimate success. Right, and that's the thing like with Roger, um, you know, we, Roger is part of a group of divers that were in the water when diving was just getting underway. So, I mean, they have all this experience and uh, they've, they've helped us out a great deal. Um, Frank Paps has uh, given us a lot of opportunities uh, with, uh, they had a um, a Valcor celebration a year and a half ago. That was fun. And, oh, it was that great. Was a lot and of fun. The man has, uh, you know, decades of, of work on the lake and knows the history and the ins and outs and is just, you know, an, an expert at telling the story. So it's just been great to have him play a role and we thank him, uh, you know, it, as, as much as anybody. He's, he's played an active role in this and so many people have and it doesn't matter if it's a small part or a large part. One thing I would like to say too is out of the photographs here, the divers that have taken place and it, it falls on my responsibilities. We have uh, two brothers, Tim and Terry Aubin and uh, Jerry didn't get the opportunity to photograph them and uh, the, the photographs I sent I guess weren't of a, a good enough quality that they were able to be on this by the time the display taken and taking place. So I'd just like to thank Terry and, and neat, Tim neat for guys. the help that they've done Wonderful for us. Um, Terry's actually helped us uh, set up a program as far as putting this on a computer generated program on where everything is. Uh, he's been a great help to us as well as Timmy. So I just wanted to get those guys in there when I could and that's the thing. We've had a lot of people um, give us a hand. Some a little, some a lot and it doesn't matter. It's an all collective effort and it's, it's really, it's come a long ways and there's just there's so much more to do. Mr. Director, get over here. And speaking of another person who's played a big role. All right, Calvin had to move us over so we could get more, a little more light on, <laughs> on the subject. 
Thank you so much for allowing us to come here today. It must feel good for you to become a part of this whole deal. Yeah, it feels great. Thanks I mean, for you, coming. You got on the wall of fame, so you must be famous. Yeah, but I'm not involved in this just for the fame. And it's, uh, I really feel we're making a difference here. I'm proud to uh, be part of the Historical Association, and I'm also uh, very glad that we're institutional partners in this ongoing research project with the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. And I think that our involvement uh, has made it possible um, for us to share this exhibit with the community here. I would like to reach out to the viewers and to ask them if they think they might have some time or might want to become involved. Uh, the Historical Association relies on volunteers and all kinds of partners at all various levels to make things like this happen. And we certainly have a lot of opportunities if, if you're interested. John. Uh, you come from a long line of John Tompkins, don't you? Are you uh, number two or number three or number seven? Or? Yeah, I happen to be number three. So everyone asked me. I know there was a story here somewhere. Yeah, what my dad's name was. Well, it happened to be the same. <laughs> <laughs> Just happened to, and his dad. And then uh, since the other two have passed away, some people ask me, do I move up to number one? But no. <laughs> uh, we'll give it to you. We'll give it to you. Thank you. How, I don't know if we've ever asked you how you got, how you became so passionate about history and how you made this connection with our group here. Well, I guess um, I've always had a, uh, a love of history, and I happen to have a particular social studies teacher that really um, connected with me and uh, got me thinking that maybe I could pursue a career in this area. So I went to school for anthropology and took some museum coursework and I worked as a contract archaeologist for about 11 years, and then uh, I had fun doing that, but I decided that um, it didn't offer me much opportunity to share the research and things I learned with other people. And um, uh, a museum setting uh, certainly does offer that possibility or opportunity, so this uh, position uh, became available, and uh, it seemed to be a natural for me since I had been living in uh, Essex County for the past uh, few years, and uh, I had worked in the region many times doing archaeology and research, so you know, it just seemed to work out. I love it when a plan comes together, don't you? Are you pleased with this room and the way this display ended up? Yeah, it's great. This is huge. I mean, the, the, the exhibit fits in here really well. The quality of the exhibit is amazing. It, it, it tells a story and it really shows the, some of the results of the ongoing research, the archaeology and the historical research that's going on. It's very important. There are, not everyone can understand the technical jargon and even wants to understand the technical jargon that the archaeologists or historians use, but this they can understand and this is a way that we can share it with everyone. And I, I hope that um, everyone will get a chance to see this exhibit. We've been reaching out to the different schools in the area, and we have had a number of school groups and tour groups come through already. So if, uh, you know, just contact us there at the museum, and uh, we can arrange a, a suitable time for you to come through. Just to remind our viewers this. again that uh, we're recording this program in mid-November 2002. These programs have a habit of being shown over and over again, and in, in uh, subsequent years, I'm sure this program will be Part of the historical picture is Ed's original interview with us uh, just after September 11th, 2001, Will. But that's half the fun. Get it all together and paint a big picture. Right, right. Um, Ed, I wanted to ask you if you are recruiting more volunteers, if you're looking for people with special skills, more divers. Um, yeah, we're, we try to keep this as open as we can. Um, and it's a matter of, of the logistics of the thing. We have... Um, we actually have a group effort every August for two weeks. Um, that's the way it's been. Now we've done three now, three annual, and I think that we're going to do it again. Is it three annual already? Already, that's and amazing. I think we're looking at a, a fourth one in the same time period, the last two weeks of August. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know how we'd go up about having somebody get in touch with us. Um, we are on the web with Historic Lakes at www.historiclakes.org. Um, they could send something, my attention on that. Um, 
I lost your phone number, but I got a hold of Jim, and he said, yes, I'll find yeah. him. He'll yeah. be on the roof, but I'll find him. Yeah, I don't know if he's going to be crazy you want me to put him to work in this aspect, but um, <laughs> that might be in a way. And a lot of it, too, is that we've got a lot of people from the community that are involved, so. Um, yeah, they, you can get a hold of the museum here, right? Yeah, we, we'd be glad to pass the word along, information along. Yeah. Yeah. This, when I, and the concern is, too, is um, we've had some people that, that wanted to get involved that, unfortunately, their diving skills just yes. weren't, you know, to the point where they could contribute and, and, and be safe. Exactly. Um, and that's the thing. This, this work is, is easy work. It's not very deep water, but it's task-oriented, and you can become so um, involved with the, the task that you forget about some important things like air pressure and things of that sort. <laughs> so it's, that's one thing that we like to do um, is if we have people get involved, we like to have them try to get involved during that two-week period because we do have instructors and uh, uh, master divers on, which I am not. I, I don't train people. Um, I have a lot of experience, but I don't train people, and I'm not insured to train people, so that's another problem that we have. Um, so that time period is probably the best. We have instructors on hand that can you know, assess people's skill and see what, what part they have, what role they might be able to take part in. Um, and then we have, we have people that we just, that, you know, that we know as divers and that have gotten involved and they'll play a role for a little while and then when, whenever they can have the time to come in, they'll come in and that's how it works. But it's, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's a loosely, uh, it's a loose group as far as how we're, there's no real um, tight schedule or any effort. We just kind of do this as we can. And uh, well, anybody that, that wants to take part in whatever way, um, and as John said, it doesn't have to be the diving portion either. We, we really need people that would be willing to come in and, and, and be part of the museum and, and take on a role in showing this to the people of the North Country. So if there's somebody that's interested in doing that, that'd be a great help. And if some major institution or store organization wants to donate, donate 500 uh, cases of film, <laughs> and some really, really expensive cameras. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry would say, okay. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing with, with Jerry's, Jerry's work. Jerry has funded all of that himself. I know. And uh, he's done a great job, and we're, we're indebted to him. Thanks. There would be okay. few things in life that would be more satisfying than becoming a part of this project. You can see how excited I am about it, just watching what all you people have done and talk to you about it. And when you can end up with a product, I mean, this is your, Jerry, this is your legacy. Yeah. Those, those four or 500 photographs plus the four or 500 million other photographs that you've taken in your Photographic life. historian, that's what's my title now. I love that, <laughs> yeah. It, does, it doesn't even have a comma in between there. Right? Right. You, it is, it's got to be pleasing for you. And I, well, I think if we've done nothing else today, we've let people know, number one, that this is a work in progress. This is a story that probably won't have an ending, at least in our lifetimes and maybe for generations. But number two, if we can inspire people to get a passion about something, and what better passion than history, your own history in your own backyard, right, John? I agree, definitely. I mean, it happened very close. It has uh, significance to all the residents in the area, and it also has significance to, uh, you know, what shaped the future of our country. Well, we're here today because of things that happened back then. Sure. We're here, we call ourselves what we call ourselves today because of battles like the Battle of Valcor and a lot of, a lot of skirmishes and things that happened in between then and the Battle of Plattsburgh and since that time. I mean, Calvin and I try to touch these things and hopefully we're making a mosaic along with your grids under Lake Champlain. Uh, I had never thought a great deal about underwater archaeology until I learned about this project. Yeah. It, it's, it's fascinating and wonderful. It's uh, one of the things about underwater archaeology, it's not accessible to everyone because it is underwater. Well, that's for sure. And the other thing that's exciting about it is usually the preservation is much better underwater than it would be on the counterpart on land. So that's exciting. I think it's also not everywhere do you have um, uh, an event that left as much of a mark on the underwater landscape as this battle of Valcor did. It truly is an underwater battlefield and it covers a tremendous amount of area when you think about it. A lot of people over the years have been diving on Lake Champlain. It has uh, 
some unique barriers for people who like to go to the Caribbean and, and other wonderful places in the ocean where they can see for 300 feet. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we touched on this before when we gave the reasons for not grabbing an artifact as soon as you find an anomaly with the, because the day's diving may be done at that point in time. It's, for that reason, it's very difficult because you don't see a heck of a lot down there. No, you don't, and uh, and that's the thing, and that's um, and like what what John is saying. This is a, as far as mapping this underwater battlefield, this is the first time anything of this scale has been done underwater. Yeah. Um, as far as it, like, it's kind of like doing a little bighorn, but doing it underwater. Um, so. And that's the thing, and like with that, they were able to find so much. I mean, just looking under, you know, the brush had burned off, and they were able to use metal detectors and find so much more about the battle that wasn't visible. You know, until that fire, and until they actually started looking underneath the surface to see what was there, and they were actually able to see that some of the historical records weren't quite accurate with what happened there. Um, so that's the one thing we're kind of doing is we're taking another look at the battle to see how things line up. And that's another good way to entice people to our area. We we're we're passionate about a lot of things, but we certainly are passionate about this part of the country. Most of us have made our lives here for a very good reason. Not just the people, and the people are tremendous, but because of all the things we've mentioned today, because of all the aspects of human existence that we have here, you know, the wonderful skies, the wonderful water, the wonderful mountains, the lakes and streams, and I've said ever since I first moved here in 1961, we have the best of all worlds here in Clinton County in northern New York, and I don't mind I don't mind uh, getting my bullhorn out and talking about that. It's very important that groups like this get together before they end their little sessions and say, yeah, it's a great place to come and visit. Tell your in-laws in Oshkosh that, you know, bring the kids here next summer. And those people who live here now, for goodness sake, come and visit the Clinton County Historical Museum and talk about it because we need to replace those Canadian dollars with tourism dollars. And now that we finally decided to go global and talk about the Lake Champlain region instead of just the Battle of Plattsburgh and just the Battle of Valcor, and we got a, we got a package deal, which is, which is kind of neat here. So let's go with it, right? Yeah, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, it's finally, I think it's coming together. Uh, we're working together on it. Um, the momentum is building. Um, more and more people are uh, coming on board and, and helping out, and everyone's doing their part. And uh, together, you know, we're headed, when we're headed in the same direction, um, uh, great things happen. They do. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank on you. short notice for gathering this esteemed group together. And if I, good luck with that roof. I'm not afraid of heights, but I don't think you'd want me Thanks on your coming. roof, so you're on your own, buddy. Uh, I'm, I'm buttoning it up for the <laughs> no VBRP, it's just ROF. So. Yeah, you got that right. But thanks so much to all these people and to Calvin and for all of our viewers and to all, all the other unsung heroes and heroines who've been involved in large ways and small ways with this project from the very beginning. Thank you for all your efforts in the future as well, and thank you for watching our little program on Hometown Cable. And who knows where we're going to be next time for our little corner.